All right, thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The following is actually a section of the Martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas, the very last paragraph, and I'm going to use it as our prayer this morning. Ah, most valiant and blessed martyrs, truly you are called and chosen for the glory of Christ Jesus our Lord. And any man who exalts, honors, and worships his glory should read for the consolation of the church these new deeds of heroism, which are no less significant than the tales of old. For these new manifestations of virtue will bear witness to one in the same spirit who still operates, and to God the Father Almighty, to his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom is splendor and immeasurable power for all the ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, uh, this morning we are going to be talking about the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas. As you may be aware, uh, their feast day is coming up uh, in actually tomorrow. Uh, it's March 7th, uh, and it uh, seems appropriate that we uh, address uh, this topic uh, at this point in the liturgical year. I'd like to begin by doing a little brief history of Carthage, which is the setting of the martyrdom. It was founded by the Phoenicians. This would be the equivalent of the modern day Lebanese who were a seafaring trading people approximately around the year 800 BC. Carthage reached its height as a seafaring uh, empire uh, approximately in the third century BC. And as you may be aware, it clashed with Rome in a series of three wars that are known as the Punic Wars uh, that lasted between 275 and 146 BC which culminated, of course, in the destruction of Carthage. Uh, of course, there's the famous uh, statement by Cato uh, that he repeated in the Roman Senate, De, uh, Delenda est Carthago, which is uh, Carthage must die. It was single-handedly the single biggest uh, opponent for Rome and Roman expansion in the Western Med. And so with the fall of Carthage in 146, it essentially ceded the Western Mediterranean uh, to Rome. And it was at that point that they could begin to think about turning their attentions uh, fully eastward, which of course they would do. Uh, the church in Carthage, its origins are a little bit more uh, gray. Uh, we're not really sure how, it get, how Christianity got to Carthage. However, we can speculate that because Carthage was a major source of the grain trade uh, between Carthage and Rome, uh, that it's logical to think that the uh, Christianity arrived in Carthage as a result of this trade back and forth between the two cities. That may appear uh, shocking to some people uh, that Rome was actually fed by Africa, not only Africa Proconsularis, uh, there in modern day Tunisia, which was one of the two bed bread baskets of the Roman Empire. The other one would have been Egypt, and that's fine. most people find even more stunning because when we think of Egypt, we think of you know, uh, camels, and we think of the pyramids, and we think of expansive deserts. But in fact, uh, because of the flooding of the at, of the uh, Nile River that actually took place on an annual basis uh, up until 1970 with the building of the Aswan Dam, uh, that whole region, uh, basically approximately an 11 mile strip of a thousand miles of that Nile River leading into the Nile Delta in the north. Uh, would have been extremely fertile because of the flooding of the Nile River. It would have taken all the muck and all the um, material in the river and deposited it on the, the uh, land on either side of the river, and it would have been a great natural fertilizer. So uh, Africa and Egypt would have been the two centers of, of trade, and there was an extensive and continuous trade between these cities. Uh, according to Tertullian, he says in his first apology, chapter 34, he describes the condition of his day. Now, Tertullian deserves a little bit of an introduction himself. He is a church um, theologian uh, from Tar Carthage, North Africa, highly educated. He would have been uh, equivalent of a rhetor, which would be somebody who had gone to law school, uh, somebody who was prepared for um, a career in politics. 
he would have had the highest level of education of his day. And he is a, a very important, really the first uh, most significant Latin theologian uh, in the early church. And he made many contributions to uh, Christian theology, none the least of which was uh, his uh, coining of the term Trinity. Uh, he also wrote the first extant treatise on any sacrament called On Baptism. I'll let you figure out what that, uh, that treatise dealt with. Um, but he says uh, in his account of uh, an apology for the Christians, a defense of the Christians, he says, the Christians at his point in time, which is the tail end of the second century, beginning of the third century, is in fact a contemporary of our heroines, Perpetua and Felicitas. He says, Christians have filled every place among you, cities, islands, fortresses, towns, marketplaces, the very camp, tribes, companies, palaces, senate, forum. We have left nothing to you but the temples of your gods. So what that does is expresses the, um, the character of Christianity already in the late er, uh, second, early third century that it had, it represented a true cross section of Roman society from the very top to the very bottom. Now what's interesting is that in Carthage, it appears that the Christians initially spoke Greek. This may shock people, but this is also the case in Rome. Uh, the Roman church appears to have originally spoken Greek. Think about this. The earliest uh, uh, evidence that we have of the Roman church is, of course, the letter of Paul to the Romans, which dates from the latter part of the 50s in the first century. And note that that letter from Paul is written in Greek to the church. And he's writing to the church fully expecting that they will be able to understand uh, his theology in the Greek language. This is important because it says something about the uh, character of the church in Rome, that it is uh, largely a uh, slave population, an Eastern population. We might think um, migrant, uh, a population that has moved to Rome from points from the East. Uh, they may have come there originally, as I said, as slaves and eventually became freed. In the Roman Empire, there was the possibility for slaves to attain great wealth uh, because they would have taken up positions even as slaves that were important in business. And then once freed, they would have had all that expertise in business that they could have applied for their own purposes. We know that Tertullian published some of his earliest works, theological works in Greek, <clears throat> on the spectacles, of course, on baptism, the chaplet, and on the veiling of virgins. Uh, and then uh, we know that one of his works uh, on ecstasy um, was never translated from its original Greek. Also, we note that uh, in the liturgy that's depicted in the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas, the angels intone the Sanctus in Greek, and that would sound that that would sound Hagios, Hagios, Hagios. Uh, in the Greek, the holy, holy, holy. Later, in chapter 13, we also note that Perpetua actually discusses church business with the bishop Optatus and the priest Aspasius in Greek. So uh, we know that she is bilingual uh, and that this is a trait that is not uncommon in the church there in Carthage. Now, what we do know about the church in Carthage from its earliest moments, so as I said, we don't know how it was founded, but we do know that from the very first moment that it appears on the scene that the martyrs uh, appear large, uh, the church in Carthage is a bleeding church, so to speak. The first time that we get knowledge of the church in Carthage is the work, a small work called the Acts of the Martyrs of Scilly, and that is a depiction of a trial of a group of Christian martyrs, I believe 10 or 12 of them, uh, five women, seven men, something like that, and uh, it depicts their trial and eventual uh, describes their execution or at least notes their execution that they were let off to be beheaded. Then shortly thereafter, that, say, that roughly dates from around the year one, uh, 180, if I'm not mistaken. And then of course you have the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas, which is of course the subject of our discussion today. And that dates, uh, their martyrdom of course dates from two, uh, 203. March 7th, 203, and the martyrdom would have been written shortly thereafter. And then, of course, we have the works of Tertullian, his Apology, his To the Nations, to, uh, to Scapula, and a variety of other works from other church fathers, Cyprian, notably from the mid-3rd century, 
uh, where he talks about martyrdom and he writes of on the lapse those people that had apostatized or denied their faith uh, during the Decian persecution of 249 to 251. Um, we have the famous statement by Tertullian that says, uh, Semen est sanguis Christianorum, the blood of the Christians is seed. And I think that speaks volumes about the Carthaginian Christian experience, that martyrdom was very much part and parcel of their experience of what it meant to be a Christian because of the constant uh, persecution that they endured. Perpetua, we know that she was uh, 21 years old. Uh, the martyrdom actually backdoors this by saying that she, at the time of her arrest, she was not quite 22, which means, of course, she was 21. We know that she was born of a wealthy family. She was a catechumen at the time of her arrest. And already, before she was even baptized, she was already recognized amongst her fellow catechumens as someone who was a mystic, someone who spoke uh, deeply with God and was able to get messages from God uh, in dreams and in other ways. We have a series of icons you're going to see throughout the uh, context of this presentation. This is one of my favorites. I like this one because it depicts uh, both Perpetua in the red and Felicitas in the white. Uh, with darker complexion. Uh, Felicitas, we really don't know a lot about her. Uh, it's highly likely, we know that she was a slave. It's highly likely that uh, she would have been of Berber uh, descent. Uh, that would have been of the natural, uh, the indigenous population of uh, North Africa. That would not have been black African, but rather uh, that dark complected kind of Moroccan uh, look that uh, people have seen before. And then of course, Perpetua, of Roman descent, but certainly of dark complexion herself. And I think it's important uh, for us to see that. Now, well, let's talk about the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas itself. It is what we might describe as an amalgamated text. It's composed of different parts constructed. And we have initial uh, introductory remarks that are provided by an eyewitness to her death who actually serves as a kind of editor of her diary, which comes right on the, on the heels of this brief introduction. Then there is a vision account that is submitted by one of her companions, a man by the name of Satters. We'll be talking about him uh, more uh, in a little bit. And then the fourth part is that there's a few brief details that uh, fill us in on events regarding Felicitas and other issues related to the martyr's final days. And then finally, there is a blow-by-blow -blow eyewitness account of the execution of the martyrs uh, that took place in the uh, Carthaginian arena uh, on March 7, 203. Now, the acta uh, claims that Perpetua's home was located in Theberbo Maius. It's about 30 miles southwest of Carthage. And throughout this presentation, you're going to see uh, original art that actually this particular piece was commissioned by myself. I wrote a novel that was published uh, on, in 2000, or 2006. It's called Climbing the Dragon's Ladder. And basically what I attempted to do was expand the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas in a novelistic way, a way that would be uh, somewhat entertaining, but yet at the same time inspirational and would give a more extended um, look into the early Carthaginian church of the third, uh, early third century. And so that's where you're going to see, whenever you see these pieces of, of uh, art, that's where it's coming from. Now, this is an actual mosaic dating from about the time of the early third century. It is a North African mosaic. And I wanted to uh, describe this to you, talk to you a little bit about this. This is a villa, a country villa in North Africa, and I want to highlight a couple things. First of all, note the tall towers. Uh, out in the countryside, the uh, wealthy elites would have been somewhat vulnerable to traveling bands of Berber uh, uh, natives who would have raided their estates from time to time. And so these high towers would have been manned by trained slaves who would have been lookout lookouts for this kind of thing, and also armed with, with uh, bow and arrow to help defend the uh, villa from uh, incursions. You can see that we have a tall wall uh, with the iron gate that would have provided defense. And then it, this uh, picture is not, of course, to proper uh, proportion and scale, but you can see the colonnaded walkway. That's what you're seeing, that second level. 
And what that basically depicts is that inside that compound, there would have been a walkway that would have been a completely uh, colonnaded so that a person could enjoy the interior gardens of the villa uh, out of the harsh uh, North African sun. In addition, we see a, a rounded buildings, uh, probably slave quarters and various other important uh, buildings for the uh, upkeep of the, of the villa, things like an on-site bakery, uh, slaves quarters, that sort of thing. Now this is actual uh, picture of the North African landscape. You can see it's a lot more verdant than one might have originally thought. Uh, it's still heavily uh, cultivated. Uh, lots of agriculture. Uh, in fact, this, uh, this particular valley, uh, I would toss this out to Father, is that it reminds me a little bit of Umbria in Italy, uh, that same kind of low-lying hills uh, with the heavily cultivated valleys. If you've ever been to Umbria, to Assisi, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Again, this is an olive grove. This has been one of the uh, staple products along with the various types of grain from North Africa. It takes about 20 years for one of these trees to come into its uh, full maturity, uh, but once it does, it can be extremely profitable in terms of the, uh, uh, the produce of the olives, and the olive oil would have been uh, very important in a variety of different ways. They would have used it to burn uh, in their oil lamps. They would have used it for cooking and a number of other purposes, including even perfume. They would have perfumed the, uh, the oil uh, with, the, uh, with the oils of various flowers, and that would have been something that the women would have had in their kafir. So um, to give you a sense of that. Now, in any event, the Romans uh, eventually came upon the catechumen group and arrested a group of them, Perpetua, most notably, and her slave girl, Felicitas, in addition, the group was also made up of three others at the time of the arrest. One, a man by the name of Ravocatus, who is described as a fellow slave of Felicitas. Now, we know from elsewhere in the martyrdom itself that Felicitas was pregnant at the time of her arrest. Uh, we know that the martyrdom says that she, at the time of just before her execution in March 203, she was actually uh, eight months pregnant. So if we do a little math, we know that she probably was uh, conceived sometime in July or August of 202. And so therefore, the arrest would have taken place, say, August, September, October of 202 uh, before their execution. So you can do a little speculation with the math based on the, the numbers that are given to us in the, the martyrdom itself. In addition to Perpetua, Felicitas, and Revocatus, the two slaves, we have two others, Secundulus and Saturninus. Unfortunately, we know very little about them, uh, whether they were slave, whether they were free, uh, whether they had any relationship to each other in terms of familial relationship, we don't know. They were held for a time uh, under house arrest, uh, most likely in the Villa of Perpetua itself. And I am uh, d choosing this picture to show you they would have been baptized during the time of their arrest you may note here, this is Felicitas being baptized. You note that she's pregnant, probably a little bit further along than a September, October baptism. Uh, but she is also naked at the time. This is, I wanted to point this out because in the early church, baptism was done uh, in the nude. And that's why you have a woman uh, that is in the, uh, the water with her. We have a source from the early church, early third century in Syria, that talks about the existence of women deacons. And whether they are ordained or not, we don't know at that particular time because it doesn't really give us a lot of info. But what it does talk about is the, the roles that they play in the early church at that time. And they say one of the reasons why you need them is because of this very purpose, that women are baptized naked, and so therefore it would be inappropriate as they are lowered into the water to be handled by a man. And so therefore, the, one of the purposes of having a woman deaconess uh, would be for that. The other purpose that they mention is that uh, when they're delivering the Eucharist to the homebound, if you're going into the bedroom of a Christian woman, it seems appropriate to send another woman in there to give her Eucharist. And so those are the two reasons um, that are given by this early church document, the name of which is escaping me at this 
moment. Uh, sorry about that. Um, Perpetua's brother at the time, shortly thereafter their arrest and baptism, uh, he himself is a catechumen, and he asked her to pray and ask God about the, the fate of the uh, new initiates. Uh, she agreed, uh, and the results were a dream that she had uh, that we could say disturbing in the least. This is a uh, depiction, an artist depiction that I commissioned to try to uh, describe what her vision describes. She describes a bronze ladder in the context, and you can find this uh, if you actually have a copy of the Martyrdom of Perpetual and Felicitas. Uh, the martyrdom itself uh, is, or excuse me, the martyrdom describes uh, this ladder, and this is in chapter 4, page 111. I'll read it exactly. I saw a ladder of tremendous height, made of bronze, reaching all the way to the heavens, but it was so narrow that only one person could climb up at a time. To the sides of the ladder were attached all sorts of metal weapons. There were swords, spears, hooks, daggers, and spikes, so that if anyone tried to climb up carelessly or without paying attention, he would be mangled and his flesh would adhere to the weapons. At the foot of the ladder lay a dragon of enormous size, and it would attack those who tried to climb up and try to terrify them from doing so. And Satyrus was the first to go up, he who was later to give himself up of his own accord. He had been the builder of our strength, although he was not present when we were arrested. And he arrived at the top of the staircase, and he looked back and said to me, Perpetua, I'm waiting for you, but take care. Do not let the dragon bite you. He will not harm me, I said, in the name of Christ Jesus. Slowly, as though he were afraid of me, the dragon stuck out his head from underneath the ladder. Then, Using it as my first step, I trod on his head and went up. Then I saw an immense garden, and in it a gray-haired man sat in a shepherd's garb. Tall he was, and milking sheep, and standing around him were many thousands of people clad in white garments. He raised his head, looked at me, and said, I am glad you have come, my child. He called me over to him and gave me, as it were, a mouthful of the milk he was drawing, and I took it into my cupped hands and consumed it. And all those who stood around said, Amen. At the sound of this word, I came too, with the taste of something sweet still in my mouth. I at once told this to my brother, and we realized that we would have to suffer, and that from now on we would no longer have any hope in this life. That's the account from chapter 4 of the martyrdom of Perpetual and Felicitas. And we can see here, I'd like to highlight um, the uh, element of the figure of Satyrus. Satyrus is an interesting figure and has been uh, the subject of a great deal of speculation, scholarly speculation. Um, I propose, and I'm not alone in this, I propose that Satyrus uh, is actually uh, Perpetua's husband. We know that she's married. It's very specific that she's not widowed uh, and that she's not divorced, uh, but it says that she's in fact married. Now, her husband is not explicitly named, but what's rather interesting to me is this figure of Satyrus. Now, we know from chapter 4 of the martyrdom, and I just reread this here, Satyrus was the first to go up. He was later to give himself up of his own accord. He had been the builder of our strength, although he was not present when we were arrested. So Satyrus was not present at the time of their arrest. He gives himself up of his own accord. He's the one to go up the ladder. What's rather interesting to me is that when Perpetua dreams, she's with a group of those who are martyred. As I said, she's, with, she's under house arrest at this time of this dream. She has Felicitas with her. She has Ravocatus with her, Saturninus and Secundulus. Uh, but when she dreams, she dreams about one person. That person is Satyrus. That's very interesting to me. Now, later on in the martyrdom, as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, we have a dream that is actually recorded that was had by uh, the figure of Satyrus himself. And what's interesting, in his dream, he is under arrest, of course, shortly before his execution, and he's in prison with this group of martyrs that we've already mentioned. When he dreams, he dreams about one person and one person only. Guess who that is? Perpetua. Despite being executed with this group of Christians, when he dreams about the afterlife, he dreams about one person, Perpetua, that they are together and that they are experiencing the afterlife together. So my proposal is this, that Satyrus, who apparently was a Christian, 
he she describes him in chapter four as the builder of our faith it's like he has a catechetical role uh, a sponsor perhaps of them uh, of the group of catechumens so he's he's perhaps well he's we know he's a christian before they are so he's a more advanced christian um, and then they end up joining the church what is uh, intriguing to me is that later on there's the question Perpetua has a little boy uh, that she's actually nursing an infant so we know that the child is uh, you know probably less than two years old and that when it comes time to give up her child the child goes to the hands of her father which is rather interesting to me because if you know anything about Roman society children are the possession of their father so in other words, what I'm telling you is Perpetua's father, even though he's the grandfather of her son, has no legal right to that boy. The one who has legal rights as property of that boy is his own father. And yet, when it's time to give up the child, the child goes into the hands of the uh, maternal grandfather. And I would propose part of the reason for that is that the father himself is out of the picture, Satyrus being in prison. Now, of course, it's speculation, it's theory, so I just want to make that clear. But I'm not alone. There's other scholars that think the same thing. And, of course, this has been one of those uh, topics that is very provocative uh, for scholars to speculate about uh, as we read the martyrdom. So I just that's kind of a little uh, side note. Uh, I hope you found that uh, intriguing about the figure of Satyrus. Um, let's return to our presentation. Now, what I find interesting in this uh Perpetua's vision in chapter four, it describes that once she climbs the ladder, which of course is the symbol of martyrdom itself, uh, she enters into, at the top of the ladder, a beautiful garden. And here's, we attempt to, uh, to depict that. Uh, you can see the shepherd in the background milking the sheep and the other people that are present in this garden. And what's particularly intriguing to me is that as she describes the garden in chapter four, um, this, this idea of the garden appears elsewhere uh, in the various um, visions of the martyrs. Satyrus himself describes uh, two different gardens, both having rose arbors uh, where they uh, meet with fellow Christians and they experience in heaven. The Romans certainly love their garden, so we shouldn't be too terribly surprised about that. But also the idea, this idea of the garden may hearken back to the book of Genesis with the idea that in paradise uh, that humanity started off in the garden, the Garden of Eden, and it's a return to paradise. Now, eventually the group is transferred from house arrest, as I speculate, the home, the actual home of Perpetua and her husband Satyrus, if I'm correct, uh, and they are transferred to a ludus, which is a gladiatorial school that would have been in Carthage, probably very close to the, uh, to the actual uh, uh, arena where they were executed. It's likely that the cell that they were placed in was subterranean, and it would have had poor circulation. Perpetua actually describes the cell uh, as in pretty grim terms uh, in the context of her, um, of her martyrdom itself. She says, and I'm reading from chapter 2, this is page 109, um, a few days later we were lodged in the prison. I was terrified as I had never before been in such a dark hole. What a difficult time it was. With the crowd, the heat was stifling, and there was the extortion of the soldiers. And to crown all, I was tortured with worry for my baby there. Now, if you've ever been in Rome uh, itself uh, and had that, the, the blessing to visit uh, the, the, um, the um, Mamertine prison in Rome, uh, Father, I'm assuming that you probably have been there. The Mamertine prison is an underground storage facility. There's literally one way in and one way out. Think of a kind of, uh, imagine a globe, cut it in half, and you have that kind of semicircular arch. That's the size of the room that we're talking about. Uh, and now imagine that the only way in that room is like a manhole cover in the ceiling, that a person would be literally dropped into that room from above. And that's the only way in and the only way out. And that's the kind of prison that we're talking about. So with multiple people, with poor air circulation, it would have been uh, a monstrous experience. And she calls it a dark hole, uh, and I'm sure for, for good reason. Now, during the time in prison, 
uh, the conditions were so bad. Imagine that there would have been no bathroom facilities, so the, the human excrement would have been in the room with them, uh, the poor ventilation, the lack of food. The only food these prisoners would have gotten would have been uh, that which was brought to them uh, by the deacons. Uh, the, the martyrdom mentions two of them, Pomponius uh, and, uh, oh, Lord, I'm, my memory today has been Tertius and Pomponius. They're actually mentioned for the first time in chapter 3, page 109 of the martyrdom. Uh, the deacons would have had to bribe the guards. That's what Perpetua is talking about with the extortion of the guards. They would have had to bribe the guards to get any food or any water or any kind of human um, kindness to them while they were in prison. And this is not uncommon in the early church for martyrs to actually die uh, during their time in prison. And one of the group, Secundulus, uh, does succumb to the conditions in prison. Now, shortly thereafter, they're put on trial for their life. The martyrs to the person confess the name and they're condemned to die uh, ad bestias. Uh, they're going to be exposed to the various animals. Uh, after her condemnation, Perpetua states uh, that she's in prayer uh, she suddenly utters the name of her long dead brother, Denocrates, which is a rather interesting component of the martyrdom. Now, I want to back this up. Let's take a look at this piece of art. If you take a look at this piece of art behind Perpetua, note that there is a man who is being restrained by two Roman soldiers. The martyrdom itself says that when, when uh, they're put on trial, that they are dragged... This is on page 113, chapter 6 of the martyrdom. They are put on trial before Hilarionus, the governor, and that her father appeared on the prisoner's dock with her son in tow, hoping that her seeing her son would cause her commitment to her faith to waver. Well, it doesn't. It ends up that he ends up being beaten uh, by the, uh, by the uh, procurator, uh, Hilarionus, with a rod, and uh, she is uh, tortured by seeing her father uh, beaten and treated in this way, who she loved dearly. And uh, what's, what's particularly touching is that after this trial, she sent for her son, uh, asking her father to give her her son so that she could have him with her in, pr in prison. Her father refused uh, to send the son with the deacons. And uh, shortly thereafter, she describes a rather interesting uh, um, set of visions that she has related to her brother Denocrates. Now, let's take a look at this. The, the, le the stories that we have of Denocrates begin on page 115, chapter 7 uh, and, and chapter 8. Now, what ends up, as she describes this, she says that Denocrates was about seven years old at the time of his death. He had some kind of facial cancer that was so grotesque and so horrible in his death experience that his family never spoke of him. In fact, that she mentions that she hadn't thought of him in years since that time until that moment in prayer where suddenly she utters his name. That night after her prayer, she has a particular dream where she sees her brother stumbling out of the midst of Hades, his ghostly form still manifesting his death wound. And this is of course an artist's depiction of that, uh, that very death wound. Now, she is so horrified to see her brother that she begins to pray for him. She recognizes that he is in need, and she sees that he is alone in dirty clothes, in tattered clothes. He's wandering, and that nearby that there is a fountain, but the fountain is beyond his reach. She's not, he's not able to reach up and access the water that he needs to drink, and she is horrified by seeing her brother unable to meet his needs. His needs. But... She, in seeing this vision, she determines that she can do something about this. And so she begins to intercede for her brother on his behalf. And as a result, uh, she storms the heaven, gates of heavens, praying for her brother. And she has a secondary vision where she sees her brother dressed in clean clothes. And now his face, which once bore the mark of his death, now only has a scar that leaves behind the rem reminder that there whatever was a wound. The, the uh, uh, fountain is lowered and on the fountain is a golden cup that he drinks from and that it never, the cup never empties 
of water. So the idea being that that he has access to all that he needs and that he is cared for. And that the water never runs out of the cup. And it's interesting because she describes in chapter 8 that he began, this is a direct quote, when he had drunk enough of the water, he began to play as children do. Now I find this particular uh, series of visions to be deeply moving, and I'll tell you why. Perpetua has lost her son. She had previously, before her trial, had received permission from the authorities to actually have her baby with her and with her in prison. And she describes that when she had her son with her, that the prison became a palace for her, that it transformed everything, that just to have her son with her was such a comfort uh, that it was that it made all the difference for her. Now she goes on trial, she confesses to her faith in Christ, and as a result, she loses her son. This is this is a profound loss. She's already lost her father who has tried to talk her out of her faith and it has cost her her relationship with her father. We don't have time to go into this, but as you see the interactions that are described in the martyrdom, he says to her, she records her father saying to her, have I not favored you above all your brothers? So we get the impression that there is a special relationship. She's kind of the apple of his eye, so to speak. And her faith, her commitment to her faith has basically destroyed that relationship between her and her father. So great loss there, the loss of her son. And now she's praying and she remembers another profound loss in her life, uh, her, her brother at age seven. And she is angered by seeing him lost and alone and wandering. And so she intervenes and she has no hesitation. She knows that she can do something about this. And as a result, she has this vision. And I think it's interesting. Imagine that she is in the prison herself. She's thirsty. She's hot. She's dry. She sees this same condition in her brother Denocrates. And instead of praying for her own needs, she prays for his needs. And as a result, he has unlimited access to water. He has clean clothes. This, imagine this. This is a woman who was a wealthy matron, a wealthy Roman matron. She's there in this fetid conditions of the Roman uh, prison. And so the idea of her having to live day to day in this squalor, this is a profound change, 180 degrees from what her experience, life experience as a wealthy Roman elite would have been. And so it's important for her that her brother is dressed in clean clothes. And now, as she describes him, he has the luxury to play. When one has the ability to play, one has a freedom of heart and a freedom of mind that the play symbolizes because one no longer has the burdens and cares of life. And that is what is symbolized uh, in this powerful vision. And so I find this to be deeply moving. And what's interesting is uh, early church fathers in talking about this particular vision describe it as uh, you know, the first instance of a Christian praying for someone who is in purgatory. And we might think about that uh, in the context of this vision that this Christian prays for, uh, for another that is in need. And as a result of those prayers that that person uh, is restored to the fullness of God's mercy and grace uh, in paradise. So again, rather interesting series of visions uh, dating from, from such an early period of the church. Let's proceed onward here, being mindful of our time. All right, uh, they are shortly thereafter, they're transferred again from the Ludus to the military prison. We are informed there that uh, Felicitas was pregnant, as I mentioned. Uh, she's about eight months along at the time. Now, according to Roman law, she cannot be executed while being pregnant. Now, apparently it's perfectly okay to murder people in the arena, but they can't be pregnant. Um, so she's going to have to wait uh, until after she gives birth uh, to be executed. Now you may say to yourself, "Well, wow, that's good. Um, you know, that's going to at least put it off and give her um, give her a little bit more time." Well, Felicitas doesn't view it that way at all because what that means is that she is going to be executed with common criminals. In fact, this is exactly what uh, the martyrdom says on page 123, chapter 15. 
As the day of the spectacle drew near, she was very distressed, Felicitas, that her, uh, her martyrdom would be postponed because of her pregnancy, for it is against the law for women with child to be executed. Thus she might have to shed her holy, innocent blood afterwards, along with others who were common criminals. Her comrades in martyrdom were also saddened, for they were afraid that they would have to leave behind so fine a companion to travel alone on the same road to hope. Now, that is a very powerful phrase here. I want to take a look at it again. They would have to leave behind so fine a companion to travel alone on the road to hope. That's a, that's a very profound thing because it is already traumatic that she is going to have to be executed in such a brutal way and for really doing nothing wrong whatsoever. But the fact that she is going to have to be uh, executed without her brothers and sisters in Christ is just more than she could bear. And so the little group uh, is described as they poured forth a prayer to the Lord in one torrent of common grief. And as a result of their prayer, their prayers were answered and Felicitas only eight months along gave birth. And I include here both an artistic rendering that we created of the birth and also an ancient um, carving of what the birth process would have been like in this time period. It's rather interesting to note that we actually know quite a bit about the process of giving birth in that period because we have one of the earliest gynecological manuals written by a man named Soranus of Ephesus that has survived. It was written roughly around the year 150, AD 150, and it describes in great detail uh, what would be the commonly accepted process of uh, bringing a child to birth. And it would have, of course, involved a birthing chair, as you saw depicted uh, in that carving and also in the piece of art. And so we actually can uh, know quite a bit about the process. As a little bit of a side footnote for you, uh, it mentions, Serranus mentions uh, the idea of swaddling co clothes. Of course, we hear about this every time in Christmas time when we hear the infancy narratives that sh she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. We say, oh, that's great. It's like baby diapers, you know. Uh, well, that's not the case at all. In fact, Serranus describes what swaddling clothes are for. The ancients actually believe that depending on how one wrapped a baby, and, and what, by wrapping, I mean kind of along the lines of mummification, so to speak. It was very tight bands that you could actually uh, influence the body type of the baby. So if you wanted a masculine looking boy, you had to wrap him in a very distinct way. Uh, if you wanted a very feminine looking girl, you would have to wrap the baby girl in a very distinct way. And that's what swaddling clothes are for. I was uh, rather shocked to, uh, to hear that myself, but I thought I'd toss that out there for, for a little influx of knowledge that you may not have had. All right, let's uh, proceed with our, our PowerPoint here. The, uh, during the period of the martyr's imprisonment, Satyrus, uh, as I said there, Catechus and perhaps Perpetua's husband, had a rather intense vision of his own of what was to come after their execution in the arena. I don't know how well you can see this, but he describes this, uh, this uh, vision that he has uh, in chapters 11, 12, 13, uh, those three chapters of the martyrdom describe this. And he describes, he's again, as I stated earlier, alone with Perpetua, four angels lift them up and carry them upright, not on their back, but carrying them upright up to heaven. And when they get there, uh, they experience, they encounter uh, a variety of things. And first he describes a beautiful garden that they're brought to. And as I stated, if you go to places like Pompeii, uh, in the ancient world, you'll see just how much the Romans love their gardens. And so I found this picture to help depict what I think is a, the kind of garden that uh, perhaps Satyrus would have, might have seen in his vision. Uh, in addition, they encounter four fellow martyrs, those who had actually been executed previous to them in the same uh, persecution. He actually mentions the names of these martyrs uh, as Jucundus, Saturninus, and Artaxius, and Quintus, those four. Uh, Quintus actually doesn't uh, suffer being uh, burned to death. He actually, like, um, like Secundulus, actually dies because of the prison conditions. But he, they actually encounter fellow, fellow martyrs while they're there. Now, they describe that in chapter 12 that they came to a place uh, whose walls seemed to be constructed of light, 
and they encounter there an old man with white hair and a youthful face. This is God, and I wanted to read this actually from chapter 12 because I just think it's kind of cool. When we came to a place whose walls seemed to be constructed of light, this would be page 121, and in front of the gate stood four angels who entered and put on white robes. We also entered and we heard the sound of voices in unison chanting endlessly, this would be in Greek, Hagios, 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 holy, holy, holy. In the same place, we seemed to see an aged man with white hair and a youthful face, though we did not see his feet. On his right and on his left were four elders and behind them stood other aged men. Surprised, we entered and stood before a throne. Four angels lifted us up, and we kissed the aged man, and he touched our faces with his hand. And the elders said to us, Let us rise. And we rose and gave the kiss of peace. Then the elders said to us, Go and play. To Perpetua, I said, the I being, of course, Satyrus, Your wish is granted. She said to me, Thanks be to God that I am happier here now than I was in the flesh. Now, I wanted to just point out there two things. Number one, that they don't see the feet of God. What could this possibly mean? Well, I believe that the reason why they don't see the feet of God is the idea that if one sees one's feet, one sees the limit of a person. One sees where one is standing. This is the presence of where they are. But if you can't see God's feet, then there is no end to God's presence, that God is simultaneously everywhere, that God is of incredible, expansive size. And we see this repeatedly in Perpetua's martyrdom, the reference to these God figures of giant size. Remember the shepherd in her garden, uh, the dragon ladder vision of giant size, the shepherd of giant size. Later, just before her death, she, in her final vision that she records, she describes a referee in the arena of giant size. His size exceeds the proportion of the arena himself, that he's actually taller than the arena. Uh, so the size is very important as symbolic of God's limitlessness. In addition, note that the elders tell Satyrus and Perpetua, go and play. Remember, I emphasized this in the Denocrates vision, that Denocrates had once he had drank his fill, was able to go and play. And so we see the same thing, that there are, they are carefree. The martyrs envision themselves as being carefree in heaven and free to enjoy all that God has, has set aside for them in paradise. I think it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful image. And also the intimacy with which they interact with God, that God reaches out and touches their face in an affectionate manner, as one would expect from a father welcoming his children home. So the dream ends with Perpetua and Satyrus expressing their happiness. And then we have Perpetua's final entry. This is the last entry that she makes. She's awakened in the middle of the night uh, by a knocking on the gate of her cell. And in utter amazement, she follows the deacon Pomponius to the amphitheater. Now, the actual amphitheater where Perpetua and her companions is, was executed is actually still in existence, albeit in a ruined state as the Italians would say, the scavi. The scavi of the arena is still in place. You'll note here that building in the middle with the, the pillar is actually a uh, shrine dedicated to the memories of Perpetua and Felicitas and their companions. You get a perspective of this from this picture. Look at the size of the wall in comparison to the people. Now imagine Perpetua and Felicitas whom the martyrdom actually describes Perpetua as a tiny woman, a small woman, a petite woman. And now she's looking up at these huge walls that pen her in with the wild animals, and then looking up where those trees are, which would have been the seating of the arena. It must have been extremely scary. This is the interior, the subterranean component. If one has ever seen pictures of the Colosseum in Rome, one knows that these arenas are controlled from the bottom, from underneath. All the operations, the, the, uh, uh, there are animal pens, there are uh, tr uh, walkways and storage places for the weapons of the gladiators and the various equipment and props that are put up in the arena floor. There's actually elevators that allow gladiators and animals to be raised and lowered up into the uh, floor of the arena. Again, from another angle, 
uh, to see, just to give you a sense of how extensive this underground network of tunnels, most of which is not uh, even visible in these pictures. Now we have here a better glimpse of what this would have looked like in nearby El Gem. Uh, there's actually an amphitheater that is in much better condition that will show you a better sense of what this looks like. Let's take a look at some of the pictures there. This, by the way, this amphitheater is still used for rock concerts and various music concerts to this day. You can see the seating, still in pretty good condition. Now, in her vision, she describes that she's surprised that no animals were loosed on her and said, in, Instead, she sees an Egyptian that she describes a vicious appearance together with his seconds. Now, Perpetua was also met by handsome young men who served as her corner men, seconds, and they strip her naked. Remember, athletic events uh, in the ancient world are, are done in the nude. In fact, we get the word gymnasium. Uh, the word gymnasium, uh, the first part of it, gymnos in Greek, actually means naked and they begin to rub her down with oil. In fact, the, uh, the sacrament of confirmation, this idea of a, a rubbing down with oil, it has athletic imagery, the idea that oil was thought to strengthen a person and to seal a person. And you know that that's an element, of course, of, the, of our sacrament of confirmation. Suddenly uh, and radically, she's transformed into a man, and we tried to depict this as best we could by creating a construct over her. Um, and she, she uh, in, encounters a large lanista, an athletic trainer, a referee of sorts for the bouts. And she describes him, as I mentioned earlier, that he towers above the arena. Again, one of these gigantic figures, God in, in uh, um, Satyrus's vision, the shepherd in her uh, dragon vision, and now this lanista, this referee of giant proportion. He announces that there will be a fight and states that if Perpetua loses, she'll be killed with the sword. But if she wins, she'll receive a green branch that is laden with golden apples. Then the battle begins. And she describes, these are her own words, we drew close to one another and began to let our fists fly. My opponent tried to get a hold of my feet, but I kept striking him in the face with the heels of my feet. Then I was raised up into the air and I began to pummel him without, as it were, touching the ground. Then, when I noticed there was a lull, I put my hands together, linking the fingers of one hand with those of the other, and thus I got a hold of his head. He fell flat on his face, and I stepped on his head. Wow, she's tough. I wouldn't want to get on her wrong side. Now, notice here, she describes a fight that involves kicking and fighting and punching. And this, this fight that she's describing is the Greco-Roman Pancration which, believe it or not, is actually the ancient uh, ancestor of the mixed martial arts fighting, the MMA fighting that has become so popular. <coughs> you notice that we have here in this sculpture a depiction of the kick to the groin. <coughs> Not, note also the nudity of the contestants. Here's a couple of other sculptures that are depicting the same type of fighting. We'll note the one on as you look at it on your right, that there's a, um, a hold that should certainly be outlawed, in my personal humble opinion. We see uh, an artistic depiction that we did where she strikes him. What I thought was interesting, and this is the geek in me, is that she describes herself rising into the air. She's flying around him and punching and kicking him from the air. And of course, the geek in me said Superman, that we have a superhero fighting and that's really what has, she has become, a spiritual superhero where she understands that she is battling demonic forces, uh, that there's something much, much greater at stake. And she wakes up with the realization that she's not going to be fighting with the animals, but with Satan himself, with the forces of darkness. Now, the morning of her death, her and her companions, as usual, are led through the streets of Carthage in what's called a pampa, a parade, and they're led on their way to the amphitheater. And when their turn came, this would have been around noon. Now, just to give you a sense of this, how does the day at the amphitheater work? And I'm going to give you the reader's digest of this. The day at the amphitheater, you have the pompa, the parade that takes you to the amphitheater itself. As part of the parade, you have the gladiators, various animals in cages. Those people are going to be executed, which are called the Noxi, the criminals. Uh, Christians, by the way, would have been part of that group of criminals. 
Uh, and in addition to that, you also have the sponsors, the wealthy sponsors of these various uh, events, the uh, gladiatorial games. It took a lot of money to put these things on, and you needed wealthy people to, to sponsor them. So they would be part of this parade, and they would all parade into the amphitheater, and then the wealthy sponsors would take their seats in the, the box seats, so to speak. They had those even in the, this day. Uh, and the morning would begin with kind of lighthearted entertainment events. Things that the sources describe things that, like for example, a, a little girl of perhaps 10 or 12 years old leading a lion into the arena and letting loose a rabbit and the lion being trained to catch the rabbit and bring the rabbit back alive, mind you, to the little girl. Uh, they describe, the sources describe dancing bears. Also the Romans, uh, not exactly, uh, afraid of, of tending to the vulgar, they love to see dwarves fight each other. Or another thing that is mentioned in the uh, sources is women fighting dwarves with wooden sticks, wooden swords uh, as part of their entertainment, kind of the lighthearted events. From there, we go into what is called the Venaziones. The, uh, the Venaziones would, spe would specialize with the Venator, the animal fighter, and this would involve things uh, along the lines of where one animal is matched against another or uh, these various fighters are matched with various animals. Uh, I would draw your attention, this is the ancient ancestor of the modern bullfights. It's no accident that the bullfights originate in Spain, once Hispania, a province, multiple provinces actually, of Rome, and that those same bullfights were brought by the Spaniards to the New World where in Mexico, they would become extremely popular. So there is a direct line of correlation uh, between these things. As I said, at noon, you would have the execution of the criminals, which would, where we would find our Christian executions. And then in the afternoon, the highlight events of the day, the battles between the gladiators. And that would be a typical day at the arena. Let's move on in our depiction here as I wanna be mindful of our time. All right, uh, the, the men, we know at least the men were scourged. That would have involved Ravocatus, uh, Satyrus, uh, Saturninus, perhaps others uh, within the group of Christians that were executed that day. And as usual, the uh, those who were condemned to die ad bestias, they were exposed to the various animals. And we actually have lots of mosaics from North Africa. The wealthy people who actually sponsored these events actually commissioned mosaic floors that depict these various gladiatorial combats in great detail. And so we see here depicted um, a, uh, a boar, which will become important in the, uh, the martyrdom itself. One of the, uh, the, glad the um, Christians that are exposed to a bear, uh, you note the kind of mechanism that the Christian uh, is on. We actually see this in the mosaics. It's like a wheelbarrow with a stake in it where imagine this, that the, the, uh, the gladiator who's doing this, the executioner who's doing this is using this wheelbarrow to move the Christian in front of the animal and then from behind the Christian, whipping the animal with a whip to provoke the animal. You know, it's very easy here to see the animal as the villain. And in reality, the animals are not the villain. The animals are overwhelmed by the experience of the arena. Imagine the sensitivity of their nose, uh, the sensitivity of their ears. There are people in the arena that are eating food just as at Major League Baseball games and NFL football games, basketball and hockey. There are people shouting and screaming, thousands of people, perhaps 40 or 50,000 people that day. Um, there are the smells of blood in the arena, the smells of animal urine, uh, other things that are out there on the arena floor and their senses are overwhelmed. And then they have this human being provoking them by whipping at them. And so uh, it would have been that kind of experience for them. The other thing you should know is that none of these animals, none of these animals got out of the arena alive. Every single one of these animals was killed in the arena, just like the Christians. In fact, uh, it was common practice for the animal meat to be given away as prizes. They, uh, this is the actual God's honest truth. They would have these wooden balls called miscellalia, and they would actually have numbers on them. And the slaves during the halftime, so to speak, would throw these wooden balls out into the, to the stands. And if you got a wooden ball, 
uh, with the number on it, you might be able to take home a lion carcass or a bear carcass or a giraffe carcass, that sort of thing, and you would have meat for your family. Now, you think there's a, wow, a lion, congratulations, that would be wonderful. Uh, but keep in mind, the poor people that would have been out there in those uh, stands would not have had meat uh, access to meat very often, and so this would have been a big deal. Think of this as in our modern-day baseball games where they throw various prizes out into the, uh, to the arena, and you can see that nothing has really changed. All right, so let's move on here. We know from the martyrdom itself that in addition to being exposed to the bears, that Perpetua and Felicitas were actually exposed to a, to a mad cow, a, a female cow. Uh, and we see the description of this um, that is actually found in chapter 20. This would be page 129. Uh, they are exposed to a mad heifer. That, and I'll read here. The young women, however, the devil had prepared a mad heifer. This was an unusual animal, but it was chosen that their sex might be matched to that of the beast. So they were stripped naked, placed in nets, and thus brought out into the arena. Even the crowd was horrified when they saw that one was a delicate young girl, that would be Perpetua, notice the description, delicate young girl, small young woman, and the other was a woman fresh from childbirth with the milk still dripping from her breast, that would be Felicitas who had given birth probably less than 36 hours previously. And so they were brought back again and dressed in unbelted tunics. First the heifer tossed Perpetua, and she fell on her back. Then sitting up, she pulled down the tunic that was ripped along her, the side so that it covered her thighs, thinking more of her modesty than of her pain. Next she asked for a pin to fasten her untidy hair, for it was not right that a martyr should die with her hair in disorder, lest she might seem to be mourning in her hour of triumph. Then she got up, and seeing that Felicitas had been crushed to the ground, she went over to her, gave her her hand, and lifted her up. The two stood side by side, but the cruelty of the, mob was, of the mob was now appeased, and so they were called back through the gate of life. It goes on to describe how Perpetua doesn't even realize that she has been exposed to the animals. It says just a couple lines down, um, she awoke, Perpetua awoke from a kind of sleep, so absorbed, the, the editor says, has she been in the ecstasy of the spirit, and she began to look about her. When to the amazement of all, she said, when are we going to be thrown to that heifer or whatever it is? Now, this is a rather important detail of the uh, martyrdom itself that tells us a little bit about what Perpetua endured. She doesn't realize that she's been exposed to the heifer. What has happened to her? I would propose Perpetua has suffered a concussion. She's been hit by this heifer, picked up and slammed her the back of her head into the arena floor, causing her to have a concussion. So you can get a sense of the violence uh, that her body has been uh, exposed to uh, with the onrushing cow. Now, just a side point here. Uh, it's interesting to note that a bull, when a bull charges, a bull lowers its head and charges. That's why a matador can simply make an adjustment, step to the side, and avoid the bull. What's interesting to note is that a cow doesn't do this. When a cow charges, the cow keeps its head up and therefore can adjust. And so therefore there is no escaping the cow. The cow simply barrels through uh, the two martyrs and knocks them to the arena floor. We see that other mosaics depicting this is exactly what happens to Satyrus. Satyrus is exposed to a leopard which bites him in the facial area, it's not uncommon for a big cat uh, to bite up at the throat or face. Note there that the mosaic, which is of course damaged, the figure of another human being that is hiding behind the victim. That would have been one of the executioners putting the body of the victim in front of himself uh, so that as he uh, whips on the, uh, the animal, that the animal attacks the, the victim and not the executioner. This is, of course, an artistic uh, rendition of this. The sword, the little dagger in Satyrus's hand, wouldn't have been there. He would have been completely helpless against the, the uh, leopard. Uh, we see here that Satyrus uh, endured a fatal or near-fatal attack of a leopard. The rest of the martyrs were not killed by the animals, so the martyrs' torn bodies would have normally been dragged to the spolarium, which is underneath the seating, and they would have had their throat cuts there to verify that they were dead but the crowd demanded that they be dragged out into the open, which was 
contrary to what is normal, and to be have their uh, throats cut publicly to see the Christians die publicly. The eyewitness to Perpetua's death states that the young gladiator failed in his first attempt to slit Perpetua's throat. She had to guide his trembling hand to the right spot. And the, the martyrdom, it says, it was as though so great a woman, feared as she was by the unclean spirit, could not be dispatched unless she herself were willing. And we know that just before their death, Perpetua and Felicitas exchanged the kiss of peace along with the other martyrs. And then this is just a picture of the, the uh, novel that I wrote on Perpetua and Felicitas, as you can see, published in 2006. And so uh, let's take a moment here. I'll be prepared to answer any questions. Let's take a, a couple questions and then uh, we'll call it a morning. Do we have a question? It looks like from St. Leo. Go ahead, St. Leo. I can hear you if you have a question. All right, um, I'm not sure. On that, uh, that touchpad, if you see if the button is orange, it needs to be gray. Just touch the orange button, it should go gray, and now I should be able to hear you. Go ahead. All right? Go ahead. My wife wants to know who wrote that information down. Ah, good How question. We, we have no idea. We have no idea. Um, there has been speculation in the past that it was actually Tertullian himself. Uh, it's not uncommon to find the... Uh, martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas to be um, along with the writings of Tertullian, but the truth is is that we just don't know uh, who wrote that that uh, martyrdom down. My question, what do you know about the accuracy of what we've just listened to and read? The martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas is regarded to be one of the most accurate martyrdoms that we have. Uh, like I said, little details, the detail of her experiencing the concussion. Uh, a number of other details that appear in the martyrdom uh, that are accurate to what we know of the practice of uh, the um, of the arena. I would say it's extremely accurate. And even little details in her diary itself, she talks about the pain in her breasts when her child is taken from her. Remember, she's nursing her little baby boy, and uh, when they take the baby from her, it describes her as having uh, discomfort in her breasts. It's a little detail, but it's, a, it's an appropriate detail. And it's interesting that it says that shortly thereafter, the discomfort went away from her breasts. And what's rather interesting is here she is in the prison in this great heat, suffering from dehydration. And if you know anything about uh, the process of lactation, that basically as the body goes into starvation, dehydration mode, it would shut down all non-essential functions, one of which would be lactation. So that pain that she experienced in her breasts would go away quite quickly as she's suffering from dehydration in the prison. So it's little details like that that give us a great deal of confidence in this martyrdom. Oh, just as a side note to mention, Perpetua is very important uh, as a woman saint, uh, if you were to go into any school, uh, any university in the country in a women's studies class, it's very common for her uh, martyrdom to be read or at least referenced in women's studies classes because in the ancient world, very few of the writings have come from a woman's hand. In fact, Perpetua's writing, her diary, represents the first known writing by a, a woman. Uh, of the church. So that is a very uh, very significant uh, component uh, to be aware of as well with Perpetua and Felicitas, uh, that they are uh, the earliest voice that we have, authentic voice of, of a woman. Andrea. Yes, Father. Uh, the, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, you certainly have brought, you know, that episode uh, alive for us today. Uh, with all of the detail and your, and your, your, your evidently very, very careful study of, of the text and the context and the, the times. Uh, in the, it just occurred to me, however, that uh, one of the works by Tertullian that you mentioned 
begin with had to do not only with the martyrs, but with those who, in, in order to avoid martyrdom, denied the faith. Um, presumably, uh, they were very numerous. The, um, it would be interesting, I don't know if maybe on another occasion you might be able to address that topic and how the church confronted it and resolved it. Yes, it is a very interesting topic. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the question of apostasy in the early church, it really came to a fore, Father. I'm sure you know this already, but it came to a fore with the persec uh, to the fore, I should say, with the persecution under Decius, the one that I mentioned in 249 to 251. Now understand that there were Christians who were denying their faith in persecution uh, from the earliest times. Uh, we have mention of such things uh, in the Shepherd of Hermas, which probably dates roughly 125 to 150 from Rome, uh, dealing with people who had denied their faith in persecution. Uh, we know that it, it went on. I mean, and let's not cast any stones. You know, imagine option A, you could stare down a 700 pound African lion. Option B, you could throw a little incense into the, into the uh, fire as an offering to the gods, call it good and apologize to God later. Okay, I mean, so you can see that there would be a certain attraction, okay? Yeah. Uh, so it, we, we want to be careful about being too harsh with them, but it really seems to become a major problem with huge numbers during the persecution of Decius. And in fact, it's very important because in the wake of that persecution, the Bishop of Carthage at the time, St. Cyprian of Carthage, is one of the leading voices that's dealing with the development of the sacrament of reconciliation. Because up until that point in the church, the church is really wrestling with the idea of what do we do with Christians who, who commit serious, what we would think of as mortal sin. They don't really have that terminology for it at that point. Mortal sin, they would class as mortal sin, murder, apostasy, um, uh, idolatry, uh, adultery, those kinds of, you know, uh, game changers, so to speak, serious, serious sin. What do we do with Christians who commit that kind of sin after baptism? Because we all recognize, Christians all recognize that baptism is capable of eliminating all the stain of previous sin. But what do we do with sin after baptism? And there's lots of different opinions on the matter. And in fact, a good deal of the thinkers seem to lean to the more conservative side of worrying that we can't do anything about serious sin after baptism. Now, what Cyprian will propose is that each one of these cases needs to be heard in turn, so we know what the details, there might have been extenuating circumstances, even within that persecution under Decius. We have those people who actually, uh, they actually offer sacrifice, and they're called sacr sacrificati, and then you have those people that simply attain a labellus or a certificate of having sacrificed. I didn't actually sacrifice, but I slipped a little cash under the table. I have a friend, a guy who knows a guy, and I was able to get a certificate of having sacrificed. And uh, they are called uh, the, the holders of the labellus or the labellatici, uh, if I'm saying that correctly. I, I have to apologize. I, I studied Greek and not Latin, unfortunately. Um, but those, uh, there is a distinction, and Cyprian recognizes that there's degrees here that need to be addressed, and then, of course, that there's a need for serious penance that is to be done for those, and then when the time is right, that the bishop determines it to be right, then they can be allowed back to communicate with the church. But during that period of penance, which could be quite extended, they're not allowed to uh, take communion with the rest of the church. It's a very serious thing. In fact, the term for it, for this extreme penance that one undergoes in the early church as a result of these serious sins committed after baptism, the Greek word for it is exomologesis, a lot of fasting and prayer and acts of penance, public confession, that sort of thing. And Tertullian, our friend Tertullian that we mentioned, actually describes it in fairly good detail, so we have a good sense of what that process is like. Anyway, that's a long-winded answer, but it's a very intriguing question, Father, uh, how that, uh, you know, that topic of martyrdom and apostasy and how that influences the development of the church's understanding of the sacraments. Thank you. So, my pleasure.
All right? Thank you very much, everyone. God bless. Thank you.